This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by Super Inframan and Allison Cook, two really awesome people that help keep this show going, as do all of my patrons. If you want to become a patron, www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight I have joining me from the Penny Royal podcast, Mr. Nathan Isaac. How you doing, Nathan? I am fantastic. It's been a crazy evening, but I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. So it, it, it has been much too long since you've been on the show. I know, man. It was when I when we uh, got on here. It showed me how long it had been, and I was like, "Oh man, it's been it's you know it's been over a year." Yeah, know? yeah. I think you came on after was it after the first one was the season was done? I think so. Yeah. It was yeah, like, uh, yeah. It was because we talked about the final winter. episode and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So now, now you have season two, which makes season one look like a, a really short um, excursion. I know, right? Yeah, I mean, it's um, and and the style is um, quite a bit different on the second season. Yes. You know, I, I decided to go. Well, you know, first season was definitely um, more in the moment, uh, lots of more, you know, in the moment, in place, um, you know, at our studio on location in certain areas. And uh, I tried to put a little bit of that in the second season, but I really wanted the second season to be oh another another sort of deeper level to to everything, you know, just sort of looking more at the research that that we kind of touched, you know, it went behind the subjects that we touched upon in the first season, and um, and also I, there was just so much I couldn't fit in the first season that it was going to end up going into the second season, and um, yeah, I just really wanted to. Wanted to do something different. I really wanted to be in control of the mood of everything, mm -hmm. um, and I really tried to try to do that. You know, so much of what I do anyway, uh, outside of Penny Royal, involves um, you know uh, music production, shooting music videos, and uh, recording bands too. So um, I just really wanted to infuse a lot more of that into the second season, and hopefully, hopefully, it was successful. I think so. Uh, it definitely has a nice uh, atmosphere to it. <clears throat> the uh, the music fits beautifully. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the, Wait, I was going to say the last episode. There's there's a a musical line in there that almost almost sounds like "Sweet Emotion" from Aerosmith. <laughs> and a couple of times I'm like, "Wait, is he going to use sweet emotion?" No, okay, this is something completely different. <laughs> It's that's yeah. It's a secret. It's a secret uh, <laughs> track and embedded in there. You know, um, that, we, one thing too I, I want to say about the the soundtrack is um, you know a lot of it's stuff that I you know samples I used or um, um, you know purchased, but also I have a uh, um, two people Boone Williams and um, Philip Clanch, um who are both in this band uh, Tiny Tiny. You know, shout out shout out to them um, that uh, they actually created a lot of the music too and uh, the opening music uh the closing music was all created by them but also on a few of the episodes i had like the first episode um a friend from nashville uh, uh zeb zorski he had this song that he had already written himself called uh jungle spice and it's the clo like after the credits there's a closing track so on a few episodes i did that um, and, uh, even ha <laughs> even the episode with, I think it's the James Shelby Downard one, the second episode, Adam go rightly. It's one of his songs mm. that he released. Um, and he was gracious enough to let me use it. And, uh, it's called, I think it's called mind trap. So, uh, yeah, it just, it was fun. It, I think that was, you know, that was a big part of the second season too, was just to, to make sure that, um, stylistically it was something that, you know, just really, really enjoyed myself, you know? Right, right, and I and I and I feel like this this takes a really good deep dive into a lot of stuff, almost to the point where I'd listen to an episode and be like, "That's going to take some absorbing." I almost feel like I need to listen to it again. Well, I mean, <laughs> there there was a, a, a part of me that was like, "Well, if people have to listen to this again, it's only going to increase the 
<laughs> you know, but uh, but I, I really, you know, I wasn't purposeful in in trying to pack so much stuff in terms of you know, I wasn't trying to confuse people. No, um, no, def- it, it flowed you know. nicely. But definitely, it is a lot of information for friends that are fans of the show who are not into uh, the paranormal or high strangeness or conspiracy stuff um, that aren't familiar at all. Right? They have zero. <laughs> zero starting point for a lot of this stuff. I think it was it was a lot for them because it's a lot of names. Yeah, and um, you know, you, I went ahead and just took a, a lot of that for granted. That hey, either a lot of these listeners are going to be people I know or who are like me that are familiar with this, and if they're not, their minds are going to be blown when they start looking this stuff up. <laughs> you know, because that's what it was for me. You know, and and a lot of this stuff I didn't know. Or I was familiar with the story, and it was something that I was like, oh, yeah, I've, I've heard that conspiracy theory, but I'd never really researched it. Or, you know, like the Danny Castellaro stuff. You know, I I knew the Danny Castellaro um, and the Promise Software story, but I never really looked at it, and I never had a personal connection to it. And then, obviously, you know, that, that became part of the story. But things like that, you know, once we started diving into it, uh, it just it was just mind-blowing. I mean, you could do a whole podcast on a lot of the things I think that are in the second season – could have an entire season devoted to them. Well, well let, let's let's talk briefly about that. That was uh, because isn't Willie Streber connected to that too? Uh, it's uh, Chrisman is tied into it. Um, with the uh, you talking about the Danny Castellaro stuff? Yeah, yeah. So, um, the Mari Island, um, uh, the Chrisman, uh, you know, the Chrisman is tied into, um. Oh, the guy's name is, I always say his name wrong, but uh, uh, Michael Rascani Uto. Okay. And so he was the uh, um, the guy that supposedly took this software. If people aren't familiar with the Promise software story or Danny Castellaro, um, the U.S. government worked with a company, a company called Inslaw, and they developed a software called Promise. Uh, the U.S. sold it to a lot of countries and governments and cities around the world and in the u.s um you know this is like 1980s you know mid 1980s yeah people's court their court systems aren't connected the police systems aren't connected their banking systems aren't and so this was a software that would allow them to exchange information electronically and this is you know pre-internet and uh it sort of created this intranet between companies and governments what they didn't realize was that the, the U.S. the CIA had put a back door into this, right? And this this is not conspiracy theory. I mean, this all happened, and um, it was sold to a lot of different places, a lot of different countries, and the U.S. government in the end decided not to pay Inslaw. I think they owed them six million dollars left on the contract, mm-hmm. and uh, they decided not to pay them because they'd given the software to this Michael Rascaniuto. Um, he creates a. He's part of the backdoor creation process. This Michael uh, Rascaniuto guy is uh, involved in all kinds of spy stuff. He does not look like a spy, but he's on this uh, Cabazon Indian reservation uh, in California, and he is uh, developing weapons, developing these weaponized software, and so he is connected through his father to um uh chrisman you know who was part of the whole mari island the original ufo sighting stuff um and then chrisman is also tied into the jfk assassination there's a, there's a whole thing we didn't even touch upon in the podcast that uh, in the second season that that is just super weird but um suffice to say there's a lot of bad stuff going on the inslaw company sues uh the u.s government for that money and it became a big court case. I think this was in around 1989, 1990. Um, and uh, there was a researcher, um, uh, an investigative journalist named Danny Casolaro. And he was, he believed, well, he uncovered the this Promise software stuff. And he believed that, the, that there was an internal group in the U.S. government called the Octopus. And he had identified these eight people who were um, orchestrating sort of a, a, a conspiracy involving drugs and gun running and all this stuff. Well, he ends up in a hotel room in Martinsburg, West Virginia, um, dead. 
and the authorities said that he committed suicide. They embalmed him w- within like 12 hours yeah. before they even notified the family. You know, there's all kinds of strange stuff. Fa- you know, a fascinating thing is that muckrock.com, which is a service that um, uh, helps you file FOIA requests. And I highly recommend it if, if you're somebody that's looking for any type of research that might involve uh, government or municipal documents. It's fantastic and paid pay a certain amount and they'll automatically file it and track the case. Mm. Um, and so I, I think I pay like 20 bucks a month, you know, I can do like 10, you know, or whatever it is, whatever the plan is. But, um, but I was able to get, you know, documents on Guterma. I try to get documents about the promise software stuff and, and Muckrock, they have a ongoing, uh, series of blog posts where they themselves have been trying to get documents in this case because it should not be classified, right? There, there should be no pushback about these these FBI files unless yeah. something untoward is happening. So, but ultimately this Danny Castellaro was found dead, um, slid his wrists in a bathtub. Well, it turns out I find out that one of the people that he had been calling all the time for information on the promise software was this junk dealer here in Pulaski County here in Somerset named, uh, Chuck Hayes. And I wouldn't have found any of this stuff out except that someone had anonymously sent us uh, a message saying, you know, hey, have you looked at Chuck Hayes? And the first article was about him smuggling uh, uncut gemstones from Brazil into the United States. And I'm like, what? This is crazy. (laughs) And uh, so so I start this deep dive and it turns out Chuck Hayes is one of these uh, mythical figures in the uh, conspiracy Usenet groups. Back in the you know early 1990s, and we ended up data mining all that stuff, and 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 looking through that. But there's just tons and tons of articles about this guy, and and he was supposedly an ex CIA contractor, um, uh, built a Cray supercomputer from from uh, auctioned military equipment, and was driving it around in the back of a semi trailer here in Pulaski County, hacking into the government's <laughs> files using using the Promise software, right? And so he even was called to testify at the Inslaw case, um, and every you know, of course, the, the U.S. government was like, "This guy's not a U.S. not a CIA agent. This guy's not, um, you know, doesn't have any background. This doesn't know anything about Promise." He takes the stand. He starts to testify about, um, you know, gives his CIA number, and then starts to speak. And they enact the National Security Act, so no one could know what he, you know, <laughs> what he said, and so. You know, that adds a little veracity to, to the story. Um, and there's a lot of backstory, but it ends up being this larger-than-life character who formed a group called The Fifth Column. There are tons of articles about this, tons of coverage of this back in back in the day, you know, back in the 1990 through 1992. And uh, But Danny Casolaro was calling him hundreds of times. This was, this was the guy feeding him information about the Promise software um, with Risk on Uto. And so, um, you know, it was one of the last people he called. It was just so strange because the Danny Casolaro case, you know, in this octopus story, which eventually it was published by uh, Ken Thomas, um, uh, he and I forget the other guy's name, they, they ended up publishing the book. But it was so strange that that classic sort of conspiracy story ended up having, an, <laughs> you know, all of these things we're looking into, and they ended up having this weird connection to Somerset or the Penny Royal. And and this was just another one of those things that I just could not believe. And it even goes deeper and further out than that. But it, there's only so much. I mean, that episode too, you know, it was over two hours long, and yeah. it's like, man, it's hard to 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 tell this story. But you know, just like what I just told you, it's you know, it's a quick summary of of that. But there were so many moments attached to it of us freaking out <laughs> that we were finding these pieces, you know, because you know, <laughs> there are those aspects of it, and then there are all the the weird aspects, the the sort of paranormal, the synchronicities and things. And even those things are strange synchronicities. Um, but, um, you know, I, I'm fascinated by the Castellero story. I'm fascinated by the whole promise software and the, um, uh, the octopus. And, and honestly, you know, we, we sort of suggest this in the second season. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if it's true or not. We ended up with those weird documents. Oh, right. That, yeah. Someone, someone gave us, um, he ultimately did not want me to, uh, the uh, people in our liminal lodge may know who he is just because early on we were talking about it, you know, but later 
once I decided to actually put it in the second season, he was like, I really don't want my name. You know, I don't want to be, a, you know, and I was like, that's fine. And so, you know, we renamed him Peter and I tried to, you know, um, conceal his voice as much as we could. But um, but we really did, you know, just in the midst of all of this, someone periphery you know, on the periphery of, of us and our group um, decided that he uh, wanted that, that we might be able to help him figure out what these documents were. Because we had mentioned the Philippines uh, because of uh, Alexander Guterma from the first season, Mr. X, right? He came from the Philippines. And then Darian and I were talking about the fact that Darian uh, West, my research partner, that he had developed this data mining software. And we were – all these documents we were getting from the FBI, all this research that we had, we were really trying to – you know, he, he had developed software that would, would build connections for us and show us some things that we hadn't seen. And so that guy had overheard that and gave us these – Weird financial documents, lots of articles, lots of weird things in there that he had tried to digest himself. But he said, listen, can you try to do something with this? And and I thought it was kind of stupid. You know, I was like, oh, come on. You know, this is ridiculous. And then a few weeks later, we actually looked at the documents and I was like, I don't know if we should have these. Um, right. But later, you know, months later, when the whole Promise software stuff popped up in Chuck Hayes, it did occur to us that, you know, the I, I don't think we've discovered anything that would warrant necessarily like disinformation or someone to be watching us. But it was one of those moments where the promise software stuff is absolutely a reality that Chuck Hayes was involved and was called in the case into that case is a reality. Um, he did have a copy of the promise software and, and I tried to f- file a four year request to get these documents, but they raided his farm. The federal government did the FBI to get the software back. <laughs> And um, and so there's tons of newspaper. I mean, all everything that I'm talking about, Chuck Hayes, Castellero, the the Promise software, you know, Chuck Hayes getting uh, raided. It's all newspaper articles, heavily papered. And right, right. Um, I, I mean, it w- did occur to us they did if the government was still watching him, right? And somehow someone realized that we were on all these podcasts talking about data mining and the way this data mining software could someone have wondered whether or not we made contact with Chuck Hayes and if he had given us a copy of the promise software, right? Yeah. And that when we kept saying data mining, did they think, do they have a copy of it? And then did they give us something to try to date? Because when you activate the software, they're able to locate the copy supposedly, Mm, you know, but I don't know. It's just one of those things where it, it did get sort of, conspiracy i don't know uh weird but there were weird people you know it was like yeah. that guy was a real person who was telling us all this crazy ass shit. and uh, you know i just i don't know it was just was strange <laughs> so the uh the streamer thing i was thinking of he was involved with a uh what seemed to be a cult when he was a kid and i can't remember it had a similar name and that's what i, I was confusing it with and i can't remember what it is now was is that true? Streeper was in a cult. As a he kid? wasn't in a cult. There was some some group that uh, he has vague memories of them taking him and testing him. But no the, way, really. But, yeah, it's in one of his books, and that's it's been a while since I've read it. And you said promise, and I went, was it promise something? Like it has a really weird, like typical name. I forget which book he talks about it in. Mm-hmm. But there, there are no, they're a up. known group, and uh, they're kind of weird. <laughs> Might have to look that up. Well, even even what you just said about him being taken as a child, you know, there definitely I've interviewed some some people here. There's no cult or anything like that. I've tried to you know squash squash that idea of people coming down here thinking there's a cult, but um, but definitely there are some weird stories of people having memories of being taken as a child, where you wonder if it's um, abduction memories, you know, or right. not not right. not by people, but by like extraterrestrials or something, you know. Um, but that's interesting. I'll have to I'll have to follow that. Yeah, I, I tried to Google street. Google search it just now, but I'm I'm forgetting the name of the group, and that's making it impossible to search because Streber's, you know, tons of Google results oh. come up with Streber. Yeah, so much stuff too. So many he has so many wild stories too. You know. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, um, so for people who aren't familiar with the Penny Royal, what what is the Penny Royal, and what's the mystery you initially kind of were looking into? Yeah. So um, our the reason this all really began was I'd moved down here to uh, Somerset, Kentucky, which is in Pulaski County, sort of south central Kentucky. And um, the name of the show, Penny Royal, comes from 
this this penny royal plateau that we're on and uh, sort of a little triangular area that's central kentucky through western kentucky um extends from pulaski county where i am uh west to Ho- excuse me to hopkinsville and uh that's where if <laughs> everyone's familiar with the hopkinsville goblins right yeah, yeah. um and where the little green men uh, phrase comes from and um that also is where Mammoth Cave is, which is the largest cave system in North America. Um, those caves extend uh, east, and then there's a large cave system here underneath uh, Pulaski County, which is called the Sloan's Valley Cave System. So if you if you can imagine it, most of Kentucky in the central part, central to western part, is covered in caves. And this, uh, this landscape, it's called karst. And so there's lots of sinkholes and caves and... Uh, underground rivers, uh, a lot of subterranean sort of things, you know. Um, but I moved down here with my wife um, back in 2011, and I'd lived in uh, uh, Lexington, which is about an hour and a half north of here, and uh, it's where bourbon and horses are are the famous thing people will know, you know, uh, right. Lexington for that. But I went to Transylvania University there, and uh, which I think is funny. Right. Yeah. The whole uh, Transylvania thing. And, and most people don't know. And I didn't know until I really started digging into this, that uh, Kentucky was named Transylvania uh, really? for a, lar- a number of a number of years, you know, uh, 1800s uh, or late 1700s, early 1800s. Um, and it just means through the woods. But the Transylvania Purchase Company uh, had had owned it. And then it was divided up into, you know, Kentucky and Virginia. Um, and. Also, for people who are not familiar with the name Kentucky, you know that it means dark and bloody ground. You know that that Native Americans, um, you know Proto Indians, uh, had used this as a hunting area um, where they would chase buffalo um, along what were called buffalo traces. And there's a, bur- a, bur- a famous bourbon called bu- Buffalo Trace as well. So, um, but anyway, I, I moved down to Pulaski County um, here in Somerset with my wife. This is where she grew up. And, um, you know, for all intents and purposes, it looks like a sleepy little town. It's a lake town, a resort town. There's lots of tourism and um, they love classic cars. They all believe in this sort of uh, post-World War II golden age. And that's Mm. sort of the vibe of the town. And, you know, I was like, oh, man, I I left the I left Lexington and I've moved down here. I can't even get, you know, um, (laughs) I can't. Can't, can't get Thai food, you know. I could, you know, the only thing that was available was like fast food, you know. And I was like, oh man, this this is crazy. Um, but obviously, I've been into you know very strange researching strange things. You know, I'm a huge fan of Charles Fort, yeah. uh, you know, the books Book of the Damned and all those things, New Lands. And um, so, you know, of course, I moved down here. I start researching some of this stuff to, just to see if they had any stories. But the the thing that really got me was that I was driving home. Uh, after work one day through downtown and there are all these people with these signs in their hands and they were and the signs were pointed toward um, the city hall they were in the center of town and the sign said you know you did it and when I got back home I asked my neighbors you know what <laughs> what's going on downtown and and that's when they explained to me that that was the family of um, two two individuals um, a young woman and uh, uh, her her little brother and they'd been murdered um, on July the 4th, 1994. And so these were family members and friends and, um, and they believed that the local people that were powerful in the local government had, had been a part of it. There was a cult, right? They were telling me this crazy cult story. And that really was like the entry point. I was like, there's no way that there's a group of these people down here practicing magic, doing magical rituals, you know, that have a cult. And ultimately there wasn't, but what I found was way, way stranger than, than anything like that, right? And um, that was really the sort of – that's what kind of got me into it. Um, and, you know, on top of that, I'd already done some research once I met my wife and found out that she was you know, from Somerset um, where I'd, I'd found this research that NASA had done on the Kentucky – what they call the Kentucky Anomaly – and it's the largest spike of geomagnetic energy in North America. Uh, Sedona is the second uh, highest peak. And then in southern Alaska, uh, that's the third highest peak. And so I, I knew that Sedona was a hot spot for 
uh, people seeing UFOs, experiencing portals, all these yeah. things. And also there's a huge concentration of quartz there. And the same thing here, this huge anomaly of geomagnetism. Um, there's a large concentrations of quartz. The geomagnetic field here in Pulaski County is so intense that there, there are all these diagrams that NASA published that it actually changes the surface gravity. Um, I mean, not to a detect, detectable amount, but it's definitely when you look at their charts, they they identify this this as a, a gravity. It's called a gravity well, I guess, in their documents. So, um, nice. but you know, for me, you know, for me, seeing those things, and then knowing about the murders, and and once I started to look deeper into it, there was a long history of violence here, and and so you know, definitely. I, with all the paranormal stuff, with people seeing things, you know, I was interviewing people, tons of stories, UFOs and uh, Bigfoot sightings and things. It's just like, is it the Kentucky anomaly? Was that that what was affecting people and causing them to see things? Was it creating portals? Was, you know, but th that really was the impetus for the first season. And that's really what the first season covers is is our investigation into why this place was so strange, why there was such a high level of violence and sightings of weird things. But then, you know, just the fact that really weird things had happened here and people were drawn here like, you know, we found the Mr. X character, Alexander Katerma, and um, and other things. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that was really what Penny Royal was, sort of this exploration of people in place, like this specific place and how it affected the people here and then how the people that lived here affected this place. And how that was um, indicative of the generation of folklore, you know. Um, and then, you know, season two, I just I really went deep into all of the stuff we were finding. So, yeah, um, that's an yeah. understatement. <laughs> so the, the the spot in southern Alaska is that uh, if I remember right, there's an Alaskan Triangle where a lot of stuff goes missing. There's a lot of UFO sightings. Is that the same area? Do you know? Well, so I haven't looked deep into it, but. Um, I do think that that it's southern Alaska is where the the spike is, but yeah, do you know what I've always wondered? I've always wondered if uh, Linda Moulton Howe's theory about the Black Pyramid <laughs> in southern Alaska that the government right yeah. because there is a portion of southern Alaska it is blocked out on Google Maps. I mean that's a real thing. There is a government base there, right? Um, now her theory obviously is that the government base is where they've uncovered this Black Pyramid right, under the ice, right, but. Right. I think I'm always like, if I take the time to dig into this, we're going to find out that that spike of geomagnetism is right where the government has those those blocked out pixels on Google. Yeah, probably. So, I haven't done it. I just haven't had time. But um, but it is one of those things like if we ever expand it in that direction, um, I would like to see. But I mean, definitely Sedona. You know, I mean, yeah, look at all right. the stuff that people in. Is, is the Stardust Ranch there? Or the it's there's a it's, ranch it's, it's that's there. Stardust, I think, is nearby. Yeah. There's one that that they shot movies at, like uh, John Wayne and all this stuff. And okay. there are stories online that you can read where supposedly the government bought that farm too because of the portals and you know who knows about all this stuff. I I, I find it fascinating. I love it. You know, but um, well, I, know, I don't know. I know with Linda Moulton House Pyramid, she was just like getting that from an anonymous source, and there was really nothing to back it up. And, yeah, and she just yeah. seemed to get kind of gullible at a certain point, and and you know it was interesting, sure, but you know it also didn't seem true. You know. Yeah, I, I agree. I, you know, on I mean, no offense to Linda. I mean, but no. a lot of things, a lot of things lately. It just I feel like people have gotten loose with some of this stuff, especially with like, I don't know, taking some of the Avery stories and the you know, there's just a lot of disinformation. Oh, that, yeah, that, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, have you have you read uh, Adam Go uh Saucer Spooks oh, and Kooks yeah. book? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So. You know, when you read that narrative, it's it's obvious that these guys were um, definitely feeding information. But even knowing that they were feeding people information, those stories are still really, really powerful today. And people are going and speaking at conferences, even though we yeah. know that it was probably lies, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think, if I remember right, he said that the seeds of the whole flat earth thing were planted as disinfo back in the... Back in the 80s, yes. in the early 80s, and I didn't yeah, realize yeah. that. I mean, I had heard about the Flat Earth Society at some point, um, and I knew it was like an old thing, and there were still some members of it. I didn't realize, but like we had in the late 90s, we did an episode of The Last Exit pretending to have a member of the Flat Earth Society on it. 
just as a joke, you know, not thinking that this was ever going to be a thing. And then it's become a thing. And it's like, how did this happen? You know, man, I've gotten contacted by two different. Uh, one of the guys was in that flat earth uh, documentary. God, I can't think of his name. I'll stop. <laughs> Imagine we'd be talking about the flat earth <laughs> society, but uh, uh, he, they wanted to be on Penny Royal. Mm. And they wanted me to interview the guy. And I thought, no, I, I was tempted just because I wanted to, I just wanted to engage the guy. Um, but he's on that, that documentary. That's it's not Netflix or Amazon. The whole, uh, is it called the curve or something like oh, that? Okay, I haven't seen that. Well, you but, know, uh, yeah, man. Yeah. I, I think the flat earth thing is, is, is a failure of society in a sense. Like our government lies to us about everything. And then, you know, you can get people who literally will doubt everything, including that the earth is round. Because they they just assume everything that that's in the official narrative is a lie. <laughs> I know, right? The government, and once you distrust the government, then you can't really get that trust back again, you know. And, um, and, and then if you find out that oh, they're the ones who started it in the first place, that's that's what's so crazy. I mean, definitely, man. When you when you look at um, you know, especially with like the Penny World research too, I didn't know <clears throat> that uh, uh, Michael Aquino. You know who founded the Church of Set? Yeah, uh, that I didn't know that he was here in Kentucky when he founded the Church of Set. I right? didn't realize that either. Yeah, so he was uh, stationed at uh, Fort Knox, and he was uh, you know psychological warfare expert. And so, um, and see, here's a crazy intersection. Think about this, man. Um, I, people may not be familiar. I know you'll know this, but. People may not be familiar with the the story of the nine Andre Puharic yep. and we did a show uh, on it know. not too long ago. Uh, did you? Okay, yep. well, fantastic. All right, so people will know what the nine are. So, uh, so Puharic he ends up going to Mexico at one point, and see the thing with <laughs> Puharic because I was talking to um, uh, Rick Spence. Uh, you know the um, he did Secret Agent Six Six Six, Alistair Crowley. Right. Uh, he's one right. of the co-authors with Bosley of the you know Empire of the Will series um so uh rick and and i and darian had corresponded quite a bit and rick is in the first season of penny royal and uh we were talking about the nine and andre puharch because there's the weird connection to oakwood that experimental mental health facility here you know in somerset uh that there were these supposedly according to witnesses and you know, people we interviewed uh that there were alien intelligences inhabiting a group of savants in a cottage at this facility, right, in the 1970s. And um, so that, you know, that in and of itself is a strange story. Of course, it sounded very similar to the nine. You know, they were saying there were these nine patients. And, and uh, so anyway, I um, I was definitely heavy into the, the nine research. So Puharic, he developed a hearing aid. You know, because he was a scientist, too, yeah. and he developed a hearing aid that uses quartz, and it beams sound into people's ears, okay? And so Rick was like, now, is it more likely that this guy who had this roundtable group and was getting all these people to channel alien intelligences, right, that were floating around the Earth in <laughs> some ancient satellite, he was like, now, is that likely, or is it that the guy that formed that group develop a technology to beam voices into people's heads right and he was like which one sounds more realistic to you and and so that that was sort of a strange thing and um you know the puharich ends up in mexico and he meets uh uh carla ruckert and um i can't think of her the guy that she was with name but um they ended up being part of the channeling of the nine and eventually channeled their own entity called Kuwako. Or no, I'm sorry, no, that was later. The, they were the uh, channelers of Ra, the Book of right. One. Right. Okay. So the Ra, the Book of One, comes from the meeting of this group of Carla Ruckard and, um, and the, the other guy that was with her and Puharich in Mexico at a secret school with Yuri Geller, right? Yeah. Well, they end up leaving Mexico and coming to Kentucky. And forming a group called L and L Research, where they began to um, uh, channel this being called Kuwako, because Ra had stopped talking to them. And in the 1970s, they were asked to to come up with an exorcism scene in a horror movie in Louisville, Kentucky, where there was this huge horror movie scene. And they wrote the scene, staged the scene, 
but it wasn't gory enough. So they called in Michael Aquino from Fort Knox <laughs> to, because he had formed the Church of Set to make a more authentic satanic exorcism scene. And there's uh, in the journals left behind by Carla and her partner, um, they describe the day that they were on the movie set and that Michael Aquino was brought in and the tension that was there. And I thought, man, think about how crazy the intersection of all these things are Yeah, here in, here in Kentucky. You know, it's just another, another strange thing. It's just like, I wouldn't have ever believed that Aquino was here in Kentucky, that he formed the, you know, uh, the church of set here, you know, so temple of set. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know, weird things, you know, it's just, I just thought, Oh, he formed it somewhere else, California, you know, but yeah, I would have thought uh, San Francisco. For some reason, I had Florida in mind, too. Yeah, yeah, he was here. And then there's some type of ritual that uh, Michelle Boulanger has mentioned in tweets ab- uh, about, um, it's called the Red, the King in Red, or it was some type of, of ritual to summon uh, uh, this like goat god, red goat god, and supposedly they performed it on the banks of, of the river here in Kentucky. And, uh, yeah, there's a whole story there. I've been trying to dig into that just because of the connections between them trying to summon a goat God and, you know, obviously pan and <laughs> all the weird, weird, like pan sightings and the pan connection to the story. So, yeah, uh, yeah. weird stuff though. Um, talk a little bit about the serious rising tapes. Oh God, man, that was so fun to, um, I love Adam go rightly and he and I've been working on some of the downer stuff, exchanging documents and stuff for the last, um, for the last year. And obviously he's in the second season quite a bit. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, I've always been a downered, uh, I won't say fan, but you know, definitely it was one of my, my interests when I discovered downered. Um, I was familiar with him from the, um, uh, apocalypse. Um, um, now, oh no, uh, not, um, I know what you're talking about. Parfree stuff, right? Yeah, and um, um, and so apocalypse you know, culture, apocalypse culture, yeah, one and two, right? He's got the yeah. two two different uh, editions of it, and so um, um, Parfree two was also sort of a fascination. Uh, I didn't, re- you know, until I really started digging into Downard. I was I was familiar with synchro mysticism, you know. I think a lot of people would, are familiar with that. They may not know that it's sort of generated by James Shelby Downard. He's not the one that gave it the name, but, um, but definitely it comes from his whole idea of uh, it, this, this killing of the King ritual, uh, King kill 33, this essay that he wrote. And, um, anyway, he's this mythic conspiracy theorist that's sort of like the quintessential conspiracy theorist who dressed in a suit, uh, had a 45 on his hip, and uh, drove across America in a silver airstream, you know, in the 1950s you know, and 1960s and 70s and cataloged all of the strange things in America and discovered this weird constellation of like magic and sorcery. And of course, he thought the Freemasons were behind a lot of this stuff. But uh, um, he, he connected things like uh, the destruction of. Uh, the or the detonation of the first atomic bomb at the Trinity site, which was on the you know Hornado uh, del Morito, um, you know White Sands area, and this destruction of primordial matter. So it's a lot of sort of the marrying of sort of mysticism and uh, political intrigue, the JFK assassination, and and it was this sort of uh, romanticized figure. Well, I didn't realize that he was in uh, <laughs> in. Kentucky. He spent most of his life in Fort Thomas, Kentucky and grew up here. Then he went to college in Danville, which is like 30 minutes north of Somerset with a bunch of the patriarchs that were so influential in shaping Somerset. Right. And so those were sort of strange connections from a, a, a larger tapestry that I knew about, you know, and suddenly it's like, well, here it is here in Kentucky. Um, and then when you read his, uh, autobiography, um, the carnivals of life and death. He talks a lot about, you know, being here in Kentucky. So he ends up meeting this, uh, famous, not famous, but definitely in, in terms of occult circles, this, uh, writer on synchronicities. And, and you know, he wrote the book, strange America, and then the rebirth of pan, uh, this Jim Brandon character 
So, uh, you know, and Jim Brandon really pops up again. You know, he he sort of does these two books and isn't in the limelight, but they're sort of classics. And uh, Hellier comes out, uh, the TV show Hellier, uh, that uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk and, and the crew uh, created. And uh, in the second season, they mention the rebirth of Pan and this Jim Brandon character. But when you look deeper into Jim Brandon... Uh, you find out that actually that's a pen name for a man named William Grimstead. And Grimstead recorded these tapes of James Shelby Downard, which are supposedly the only tapes in existence of Downard. Um, and um, he and, a, and another guy named Michael Hoffman, um, who also has written a number of uh, very famous sort of uh, conspiracy books and essays, they recorded the Serious Rising tapes down in Florida, uh, down in St. Petersburg, and uh, probably around 1974. And so uh, Jim Brandon, you know, uh, the, this William Grimstead, was selling those tapes and uh, selling CDs eventually through Lauren Coleman, um, who was who's very big into synchromysticism. And so anyway, there's this – you find this this, this crazy, crazy – uh, recordings of Downer talking about JFK's assassination and connecting all these things together um, in, in sort of a weird synchronistic way that there's this larger magical tapestry to, the, to, the, to our existence. And then you find out, though, as we found out and others have found out, that, you know, Jim Brandon and who is uh, William Grimstead and Michael Hoffman were um, involved in um, – some of the um, racist, I would say, movements. Yeah, the you know they were tied into Willis Cardo and the Liberty Lobby and uh, building the uh, the American Neo Nazi Party. And uh, there's some involvement with uh, Holocaust denial groups. Yeah, uh, and so anyway, it's just one of those things where I was definitely. At first, before I knew a lot of this stuff, a big champion of synchro mysticism and the idea that there, because I mean, it's true. I mean, you look at the JFK assassination, think of all the crazy things that happened that, that seem all probably true, right? And then you got the stories of, uh, of um, you know, just, just different people that were in the right place at the right time. They saw something um, and, um, and it just seems to be an underlying connection to many, many different things, right? And I don't know, man. It just it just seemed to make a lot of make a lot of sense for a lot of strange things that have happened, right? Even the Fortean phenomena stuff. It was like, man, you know, maybe these guys really did figure this out. But then you find this fascist element to it, this fascist undercurrent, yeah. and you know, and I, I've always been a huge fan of um, David Southwell's Hookland series too which is very much about uh re-enchantment is resistance uh reclaiming local folklore from fascists because that's what fascists do they come in and they try to tell you you know hey this this golden time that existed before these people showed up you know we you remember that you know right, <laughs> like these right. people screwed it up and so that was happening when you start looking at this that started happening in the para weird and the paranormal and the conspiracy communities Back, it started in the '80s, you know, with with uh, you know some of Parfrey stuff and some of these publications, and then has carried forward to now. You know, a lot. Of, you know, I talked to Michael Hughes, um, you know, the author and researcher, and and other people too. You know, Adam and you know they saw the change happen. You know, in in these yeah. communities, the the shift away from being inclusive and being, um, I don't want to say left leaning, but definitely more progressive, right? And then it right, became right conservative and um i don't know really 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 nasty and and so i that was another thing that i i didn't see the story going in that direction and and uh adam and i were working a lot of stuff exchanging documents and and i actually ended up um befriending adam parfrey's biographer um and he um, gave me a lot of documents and allowed me to look at a lot of stuff that no one else had seen correspondence from Grimstead to Parfrey and Hoffman and, uh, and even other things too. And, and it really did paint this picture that there was something deeper going on in, a, in the communities that we're all a part of, 
you know, and, and going on for a long time. Uh, that that may not have been intentional, maybe it was, but definitely caused a, a shift, you know, gradually over time. And and I really wanted to to address that, you know, in the story too, to to sort of see to to reveal to people the same way that the same experience we had, where it was like we were all about this, we were really promoting this, and then we saw that what we were doing was was propagating some of these things that uh, we needed to take the narrative back rather yeah. than trying to just propagate the same old narrative. And um, so I really wanted the second season to to hammer that home. You know, in, in the ninth episode, we really do. But, I, you know, I've tried to sort of pepper it throughout. And, um, and you know, honestly, the second season was really about being way more inclusive in terms of having hugely more diverse um, voices, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, and I do think, uh, you know, I think women are... are uh, and minorities aren't really seen uh, as much in the paranormal and conspiracy communities. You know what I mean? It's no, just, they're definitely not. UFOs too. You know, it's like uh, so. There's so many amazing researchers out there um, who are you know, who are women and, and minorities are just you know they're not you know white dudes sitting around <laughs> talking about UFOs. You know, <laughs> yes. and. And so, uh, so yeah, so I, I really wanted to make sure, cause I, I, you know, honestly, I felt like the first season when just the, the only woman that was in the, you know, first season of Pennyworld was the person that was abducted, abducted by a cult. Right. 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 And so uh, I was, you know, everybody else was just some guys sitting around talking about these stories. And again, these were the people that I'd interviewed, but in the second season, I really wanted to highlight more, more voices, more people and friends, you know, that I'd met through research and through, um, you sort of grow, you know, this narrative unfolding, you know, um, so, um, which, which has been, fan- I mean, you know, that's one of, been one of the, my favorite things about the second season is just how many people I was able to connect with and talk to that helped me understand sort of how to look at some of this s- strange things that are happening. Um, and, and just to hear their stories too, because everybody's had, oh man, it's, it's everybody's had the same experiences, but different experiences. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there, there was a lot of stuff just in your final episode alone that really, uh, could be entire shows. Um, I mean, one of the things you talk about is, is the concept of reality, but, uh, one of the things I've always said is that we don't, you know, when you deal with things like near death experiences and stuff, I'm like, we don't know what death is because we don't also, we also don't know what life is and we have no idea what reality is. We're, we're in, immersed in it, so there's no way to kind of like, you know, it's, it's like the eyeball can't see itself directly. And you kind of touch yeah. on that in there and this idea of, of reality being much bigger than any, any of us could even imagine. And that's exactly the way I feel. I think we're a small sliver. Our consciousness here is a small sliver of something immensely bigger than we could ever imagine it being. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, I guess that, you know, some, some, some people have said to me, they're like, Hey, in the second season, you you got more away from the story of Somerset or you know the story of the Penny Royal, this place. But you know, for me, the story was also about how we were affected by what we found, and and definitely it was this. Um, I don't know. For me, it was just this personal journey of 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 looking at things differently, of looking at reality, and like you just said, you know, that what is life? You know, we don't even, we don't understand death. We don't know what life is really. And and we all experience all of these strange things, um, and and a lot of these strange things seem like deeply personal experiences, and 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 that definitely in the first season that carries through into the second season um, is this idea of cybernetics, you know these yes. these you know feedback loops, and and that's a real thing, you know we don't even have to venture into the the realm of the weird or the occult, you know I mean we know that. Um, you know, cybernetics was a real thing, and 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 they really started studying it at these Macy conferences. You know, before I had talked to um, Stephen Snyder, who's um, one of our great friends now, and um, he has a podcast called uh, The Farm. It goes by Recluse. Um, he's a great uh, parapolitical researcher. I wasn't, I didn't know what parapolitics was really until I started looking into this stuff. Um, and he was the one that mentioned to us uh, the research on the Macy's conferences. So you see that scientists really did start to look at the world through this idea of like second order cybernetics. Cause I always thought cybernetics was like the terminator, you know, right. right, right, right. <laughs> like, you know, I, I didn't realize it was the study of control systems. And so second order cybernetics obviously is, is 
this concept of, you know, it's all about observers and this idea that an observer observes a system and that creates a cybernetic system. But when the system observes that observer observing the system, it creates like a second loop. And that's known, um, a, a researcher named uh, Hans von Forster, um, he put forth this idea of second order cybernetics, where it's the system is aware of the observer observing the system. And I think that's where synchronicity lies. I think that's where a lot of our encounters with the other emerges is sort of in many ways an, an encounter with ourselves and with something that's um, a deeper part of reality. But again, it's like th- looking at this stuff, looking at this mystery and trying to understand some of these experiences we were having. That's what caused me to start asking these other questions about reality. And it, it's just funny how it was such a marriage of what we were already doing. You know, Darian and I were already, um, again, Darian West, my research partner, we were doing data mining for a number of automotive companies, you know, here in the U.S. We were data mining all the VIN numbers in America. Um, we'd been hired by other companies to do data mining. So we were even working with some cryptocurrency algorithms and things. And so it was, it was strange that that was what we were looking at, this idea of data and information systems. And then, you know, here comes along this, this whole mystery that we're researching and cybernetics is, is, is given to us as a, as a optic to look at this. Um, And then, you know, we're already studying Shannon entropy and randomness. Right. And, and there's such a connection between that and like, Peter Carroll's, uh, P. Carroll's, uh, chaos magic. Right. And, and it's, that's the way that all of this has always felt is even what I'm saying right now, it's like a, a, a flower that's block that's just unfolding. Right. Cause you're, you're having all of these things that seem to be connected together. Um, like you said, that, that they could all be their own story, you know? Oh yeah. Easily. Um, but definitely it, it was this, I, you know, looking at reality, I mean, especially the cryptocurrency stuff, you know, thinking of, reality is uh, um, being encrypted from you that that magic right um, can be used to and that that is what magic is like historically magic and cryptography evolved side by side right because you know John D some of these you know Ramon Lowell some of these early uh, magicians and researchers um, and and academics they were trying to to decode the language of the angels, right? But of yeah. reality, right? They were they were trying to strip it away, you know. Um, and so there is this idea of an encrypted reality, an occulted reality, and that if you can uh, properly find, you know, find the right code, you'll unlock it. And that's so much what encryption is now, you know, and so much even us talking right now. Um, it involves encryption, you know, it involves an, an encrypted handshake um, through data. And so, um, yeah, I mean, all of those things started to unfold. And and when you look at it that way, I, I think there's, you know, life in many ways is f- fractals. You know, it's turtles all the way down, you know, from the <laughs> top to the bottom. And so I think when you see these these things that seem fundamental to the functioning of a system, that you can extrapolate that, you know, out into understanding the larger systems, you know, that are at play. I don't know, man. It's, <laughs> so, it's crazy. So, so a second order cybernetics, what you're saying is that like the, these, you're observing a system and that system then observes you observing it and then responds to the fact that you're observing. Right. I- information is then entered into the system. So then you as the observer are witnessing, um, what you're witnessing is actually a product of you witnessing it. Um, but it continues, you know, and, and, and it's sort of like um, um, the Heisenberg, you know, uncertainty principle that if you try to find the position of something, you're going to change, you know, if you try to check its speed, you'll change, change its position, right. you know, particles position. And so, you know, part of that's built into it in the sense that you are, in, instead of you being a scientist outside the system and affecting it, you become you. You are in the that system, right? And so, and the system is is aware that you're a part of it. I guess that's the thing that's so strange about it is that these scientists were basically suggesting that a system could be aware of itself and something inside of it, right? And I, and I think that's that's kind of the idea that consciousness just permeates 
You know, any yeah. anything complex, any system complex enough will show some sign of consciousness, even if it's not necessarily recognized as life as we know it. There, there's, there's something intrinsic about consciousness. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. And I, see, I think that that's what um, I didn't really get into this so much in the second season, but I really do think that you know we know MK Ultra existed. We know that uh, that you know there there were all these groups that were uh, researching the mind and um, and reality and consciousness in the you know 1960s, 1970s. I really do wonder, man, if if these scientists didn't discover this whole idea because second second order cybernetics vanished right i mean after the macy's conferences it really didn't resurge again until about 15 years ago right when we started the internet so it's like there was all of this focus on it and they were really looking into how systems were built within systems and how this involved consciousness and all these things and then it just vanished but you wonder if the government or groups, private groups, even that were researching this, um, didn't discover that there really was a connection to reality and the way that reality functions and human consciousness and systems and, and creating these cybernetic systems. You know, I mean, I know that sounds a little, cons- you know, it's stranger things kind of stuff. Right. But, um, but I really do wonder, you know, did did they, you know, did, did research sort of go underground on cybernetics um, or regarding cybernetics because they began to make these inroads that now we're making again, you know, that we're yeah. we're all starting to ask these same questions that they were asking in the 1960s and 70s, you know. And and that is what would happen if that were the case. I mean, they would it would be very quiet, you know. It would yeah. either be farmed out to black projects or to private companies that don't have to answer to anyone. See, I, that's I always wonder about that, man. You you know what? Because you know they didn't just retire MK Ultra. You know, I mean, oh, no. I don't think they were dosing people with LSD anymore, but definitely they were taking it deeper in terms of exploring. Um, they had, I mean, they had successes. We know they did. They did had you know over ten years of funding for it. So that well, something had you know the the annual you know do, do, how, what do how, what successes do we have? They had to have had some, you know. And, and keep in mind what we know about MK Ultra is only what survived them trying to destroy all the documents. Right. Yeah. And like, <laughs> yeah, I always think like, what did they destroy? Was this the stuff they destroyed? Where they were like, oh yeah, we've 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 made contact with you know reality. You know, <laughs> we're all living in a simulation, know. and we figured out how to get out. Uh, I, I, you know, one of the funnest things that I encountered while i was researching this was you know david metcalf um have you spoken to him before yes. yeah um, um i love david um uh, blows my mind every time i talk to david <laughs> it's just like oh man um but he was you know his research on, on ramon lowell um you know i started researching a lot of this uh, cryptography stuff because of the james shelby downard story um he mentions a device um in his uh supposed biography called the um um the Dayton Witch, right? And it's, it seems to be, from the description, an Enigma machine, right? But from World, World War One, And I'm like, well, those weren't around until World War Two. And then you research it, and it's like, actually, they were invented in World War One. Explain, you know? and you're explain like, to oh. people what that is. Uh, the Enigma machine? Yeah. Um, was uh, a, div- a cryptological device that um, the Germans had employed to send encoded messages. Um, and then if, if you're familiar with Oh, I forget the name of the movie, but it's about Bleckley Park and uh, their attempt to build these. It was called the Bomba. It was this huge uh, cryptological device that could take an Enigma machine message and then use all these tumblers to break down the message. And, and yeah. it was totally fascinating. But um, but there's I started looking at that. I I read a paper an article that uh, David Metcalf had had put out online about Ramon Lowell and these um, what are called um, it's Ars Combinatoria or Combinatrixes. Um, they're formerly called Lowellian circles, but they're like concentric circles of paper, and they have all these symbols on them, and you can like turn them in different combinations. And um, early sort of Christian mystics uh, were trying to use them to sort of unlock a way to speak to God, right? So you're already talking about unlocking reality, you know? Um, and they were based on an earlier um, 
machine learning sort of computational this is the beginning of computational logic which would eventually become computers um an arab device um an arabic device that was called the zarya and again it, it used sort of mechanical computation so when you start looking at all this stuff it's so crazy to see the correlations between that and all of the cryptocurrency stuff right and right, and right. the encryption and the data mining and um and yeah so i you know <laughs> I, I really enjoyed sort of discovering that from david and david sort of talk because he you know he's a, a, a media expert you know in many ways um and his idea his knowledge of information theory and some of the things we were talking about especially with jacques Vallée mm -hmm. and um the ufo researcher astrophysicist uh, or astronomer um and the fact that he was involved in the early beginnings of the internet right well um, more than that yeah i mean he basically invented uh search engines uh, yes, because he started. He st he got he got into astronomy to to research UFOs, only to find out they were destroying any trace of UFOs that they picked up. Uh, and then he went into computer science, and like I remember in his, his uh, Forbidden Science, the first one, his journals, he talks about how you know they they were able to search for numbers, and he said, "I think I can do this with with words. I think we can add you know more stuff in." And whatever company he was working for said, no, you can't. Just go back and do your job. And so he, he got hired by someone else. And when he said it to them, it, they were like, if you can do it, do it. And so he created like one of the first search engines that, that could search for uh, phrases and stuff. Isn't that amazing? You know? <laughs> yeah. The guy is absolutely and, and, brilliant. Yeah. And you know, he was one of the first people to create the TCP IP protocol, yep. right? That, that, that created the internet. It was the first chat system called planet. Uh, he invented that too. And, um, it's just, it's crazy to think how much influence he had on the, our lives now. Yes. But then yeah. he was researching all this stuff about UFOs, you know? <laughs> um, I know it's crazy, uh, and you know uh, David Metcalf, and you know, we talked about this in the the finale of the second season. Um, uh, this whole idea that when they created the early internet, there were all of these synchronicities that started to happen amongst the research. You know, it was all scientists yeah, uh, yeah. that were part of DARPA, and he said that they started to report. And Valet actually ap apparently wrote a paper about this that all of these synchronicities started to crop up once people started to become networked together, um, which I think is insane. I haven't looked into, I haven't read the paper yet, but it's one of those things where I'm like, oh, you know, there's gotta be, there's got to be something to all of this. I think, you know, I mean, we're, it's, you know, we're never going to figure it out, but it's like, the the thrill is scratching at the surface yeah of it, yeah you know well the more we figure out the, the, the better questions we have you know i mean and that, that's part of it asking better questions uh, uh greg bishop always makes that comment and he's dead on i mean we've been studying this this anomalous phenomena for in some cases hundreds of years and we haven't really gotten any further after a point and i think it's because we stopped you know we're not asking the right questions you know we stopped looking for new questions yeah and now, and now we have so much information. It's, you know what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, it's hard to sift yeah. through to, to even ask anything meaningful, you know? <laughs> That's um, also true. Well, I mean, like you touched on, on, on locations and, and basically earth energy, and that's certainly a part of weird experiences. Um, you know, that, that, that goes back to, um, the earth light stuff with, uh, Paul Devereaux showing that so many UFO encounters were happening along fault lines. Man. And, the the thing that we found to see, I wasn't familiar with Paul Devereaux until, um, oh, oh, who was? I think the way this played out was that um, somebody had an article of no, I know what it was. It was the um, uh, William Grimstead had uh, had written um, uh, what's his name uh, Robert Anton Wilson. Oh yeah, and. Uh, he had just he hadn't published uh, Cosmic Trigger yet, but he had published some stuff about it, I think the Illuminatus trilogy stuff might have coming out, but came out uh, came out by then. But um, he uh, but so anyway, Grimstead writes him and, and tells him about James Shelby Downard, but also tells him about a group of a uh, contactee cult 
and that we're in in contact with this uh, entity, right? This alien entity, um, non-human intelligence called Jiro, J-I-R-O. And I remember reading it in Cosmic Trigger because I was trying to chase down all the Downard stuff, and Downard is mentioned in there, and, and that's the, actually the first mention of Downard in print is in Robert Anton Wilson's uh, Cosmic Trigger. And so, uh, so I, I was trying to find that article. It was in the Fortean Times, but the Fortean Times used to be called the Fortean News before it changed the Fortean Times. And so I could not find this article that he references because I thought, hey, here's another you know, uh, UFO cult or contactee cult. They're talking about channeling alien intelligences. I was trying to research all this stuff with Oakwood here. People telling me that people were, you know, channeling alien intelligences tied into, you know, Puhars and the Nine. And so uh, uh, a member of our Patreon, the Liminal Lodge, had that collect in his collection and sent it to me. It's a two-part article by uh, Dedra, right? And uh, uh, he's talking about Earth lights and things, but it's like 1973, and they found this weird place with these cults and all of these UFO sightings. There's a geomagnetic anomaly. There's yeah. a meteor yep. that's crashed. Like he starts listing all this stuff, and I'm like, this is Penny Royal in the UK, <laughs> you know, in the UK in 1973. Yep. But I, I wasn't familiar with any of uh, his work, and then I started digging into it, and he has a ton of great stuff on ley lines and telluric energy and all that stuff. Oh, yeah, know? absolutely. Um, He's and, still alive, too, right? Yes, as far as I know. Yeah, yeah. Because at one point I thought, man, should I contact him? But would he just be like, who's this crazy dude? <laughs> <laughs> um, who was it? Oh, Andrew Collins also had a book he put out called er, uh, Alien Energy that's pretty interesting on that type of stuff. Well, are you familiar with, you know, we talked in the, <laughs> again, second season is in, in a way all over the place. It's not all over the place. You know, it was sort of the, it's the big. natural progression. The, 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 it's big. Big, it's, yeah. Yeah, it is. But But, I mean, they were... Yeah, you know, I tried to tell the story the way that it unfolded for me also. Yeah. You know? um, but there was the psychic questing thing that came up, you know, this idea of is some of this stuff psychic questing? You know, when you read uh, the Green Stone, the right. Seven Swords, the Meania Stone, all that stuff, yep. Andrew yep. Collins's books, you know. Yep. I wasn't familiar familiar with any of that stuff either, you know? And then you 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 see this this story of psychic questing, right? And mm -hmm. that these guys were finding all this stuff and it involved a lot of randomness, you know? Yes. Um, not, and I, I was able to talk to uh, Charles Topham. Um, I, I was who, just going to bring him up. Yeah. You know, and I love him. Um, um, he just messaged me the other day. I need to get back to him, but um, uh, you know, he was one of these people that was on the, in that scene. He yeah. found two of the, me and Nia swords yeah, uh, with, a, with his partner at the time. And, um, and it was great talking to him about those experiences because there are elements that seem to match up with sort of like randonautica, right? Right. You know, of, right. of going to it, like sitting in a circle and the first person that, you know, has a tree pop in their mind, they try to drive to where they think that place is. And then another person tries to imagine they're getting, getting a message or a communication or transmission. And so, there was this um, creative sort of element to it. And, and again, it's like these observers adding information to this system, right? And it was really fascinating to talk to him about all this stuff, but, um, but then to later find out that the psychic questing was actually an older art, yeah. you know, that, that, that Tibetan monks practice this, and that what they, what they actually look for is called terma, which is hidden treasure. And I thought, man, how weird is it that we found this Mr. X character that shows up out of nowhere and ends up in Somerset, Kentucky, who buys a mine from the vice president of the United States at the time, Spear Wagner. There are all these allegations of magic and occultism at this mine. <laughs> and his name is Guterma, the good treasure. Yeah. And, and psychic questing, the treasure is the terma, right? And, and you know, even if it doesn't mean anything, it meant something to me. It meant yeah. it was sort of like a little, like wink and chuckle from the universe when I found that. Well, you know, uh, Keel would also talk about the name game, 
where you would you would get name you know like three people would have UFO settings and they'd all have the same last name and it wouldn't be a common name like Smith it would be something unusual and they'd be in three different parts of the country and on the same night have a UFO sighting yeah 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 well I, you know I think it's important to take note of those things I think you know again I I, I don't practice magic but definitely obviously now researched a lot of magic and have researched a lot of, of people who make magic and ceremonial magic and chaos magic parts of their lives. And so I definitely, you know, it always comes up in the conversation of taking note of things like that, you know, and Kiel's obviously talking about it in terms of, uh, you know, aliens or UFOs, but he's also talking about it in terms of high strangeness. Yeah. And I, I just, a lot of this stuff that we've categorized, into all these nice little neat buckets. I just think they all, all the buckets need to be turned over. We need to dump everything in one single pile because it just seems like, you know, take note of the names, right? You know, it's in magic. Take note, take note of these little things that are happening because it's the communication from reality or your environment, you know, that, that you need to take note of, of a, of a system that's forming. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, that you're hoping to have influence over. And then you have these, systems that seem to be outside of humans that you know john keel is in, in you know interacting with but they're attempting to have an influence and, and in a way he is the lens through which that information is focused because we wouldn't even know about that unless he were to say hey this is strange we should look at this you right know? right and then it, and then it builds yes yeah yeah i mean god man i wish someone would make a tv show that was just the John Keel files. Yeah, we, you know we, we just talked about I, that recently. He's one of those people who could you could make a series on it. It would be utterly fascinating. Yeah. Well, have you noticed too? Like I, I was talking to a, a producer friend of mine uh, the other day, the fact that you know high strangeness is not a part of popular media. You know, all of no. these ghost hunting shows. You know, whatever the shows are. You know, there's a wide range now. There's so many streaming shows. None of them actually use the phrase high strangeness and they should be no but they're they're also very uh, narrow focused true you know true. you got yeah. a lot of people into ghosts who don't care about ufos or bigfoot or think that stuff's silly and the same with yeah. you know the bigfoot people think the ufo people are crazy the ufo people think the ghost people are crazy and it's like but there's so much crossover in this phenomena and people don't see it because they, they look at them as completely different things yeah yeah and and <laughs> I was talking to a, a Bigfoot researcher last year um, and here in Kentucky and and we were doing an interview and I was asking about all the, the sightings he had had. And I said, man, what's the, have you seen anything strange? Like something that you just couldn't explain. I was like, obviously seeing Bigfoot is strange, right? right? But I was like, have you seen anything that was like stranger than that? And he was like, no, 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 it's Bigfoot. You know, <laughs> I was like, I was like, you haven't seen like, Balls Lights. of light. Or, right. Yeah, yeah. Or did Bigfoot change into a ball of light? You know, like I just, <laughs> he was like, and he took a long pause and he finally was like, well, during a bunch of the sightings, we saw balls of light. And once we saw one of the Bigfoots transform into a ball of light, yeah. he's like, hey, but he said, he said, he said, but we don't consider any of that because we, we were having a hallucination or something. Right. You know? Right. <laughs> and I was like, you, you just said Bigfoot changed into a ball of light. And he was like, yeah, but that we saw that wrong. <laughs> and, and Cause he absolutely believed and I kept grilling him on it. It was like, you know, is it a flesh and blood creature? Is it something else? And he would not, he was like, it is only, it is an ape, yeah. right? It is yeah, a yeah. hominid. And I was like, but how do you explain what you saw? And he was like, it's nothing. It, it probably didn't happen. I'm like, but seeing Bigfoot, <laughs> seeing Bigfoot happened, seeing Bigfoot turn into a ball of light didn't happen. Okay. Right. You know? So, you know, it, it is, you're right. You know, there, there's such a, there's like a, a myopia yeah. of sorts, you know, that, that people are, are only seeing these things. But I mean, I, I feel like your show and so many shows right now that, that, that people are tuning into and listening to researchers and, and people that are in this scene right now, um, that's where it's shifting to, you know, like that, that we're all so. the ones that are driving that conversation, you know, we're trying. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I was the one that pointed out that, that Bigfoot and, you know, most of the time when people go out and they, they're hunting Bigfoot, what they're experiencing is poltergeist phenomena. Mm, yeah. Cause they no, hardly ever see Bigfoot, but they get rocks thrown at them. They hear vocalizations. They, they get all this stuff that you get in poltergeist cases, lights. 
and and it's like okay but you're ignoring the fact that you know they're like no no, no but it was it was an ape doing it and it's like <laughs> But poltergeist phenomena mimic things, you know? Right, if, right. if you think it's a ghost, it's going to seem like a ghost. If you think it's an ape, I mean, I can't say it's not. There might be a Bigfoot out there throwing rocks at you, but it's also poltergeist phenomena. <laughs> it's so, it, you're so right, man. And then like uh, with the UFO stuff, I mean, it's, 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 it's dead on uh, fairy Oh yeah. Abductions yeah, and absolutely. stuff, you know, like Josh, all of Josh Cutchins research, yeah. you know, and, and, like that's a real thing. I mean, you know, with Dan Dutton, the artist, one of my close friends, you know, who's a big part of Penny Royal, um, and a big part of sort of engaging with the world as art and art, yeah, in, in a in a way that transforms reality, you know. Um, but you know, it, it's it's so it's so funny that you know he sings. He's one of the last people, a few singers, ballad singers. Uh, bards in a in a in the world, but in, definitely in the United States, that can sing the child ballads, right? These old old, um, the the first English language stories, you know, were the child ballads, and a lot of Wicca and Wiccan uh, spells and beliefs are encoded in the child ballads, also, uh, as as a lot of researchers have, have shown. But those ballads are some of the first s- descriptions of. UFO abductions and it's by fairies. Yeah. Right? Oh yeah. yeah. And, and, and to me, that's just, you know, it's undeniable. It's just simply, and even the idea of fetches, you know, like where they, they take a baby and replace it with a block of wood that changes into a baby, right? right? That you're, yeah. that you're getting a cloned baby, right? <laughs> or, you know, just the whole, the whole UFO narrative, all of Whitney Strieber's stuff sounds like, uh, fey yeah. interactions. Yeah. And and to Strieber's credit, he never insisted this was extraterrestrial. Oh, yeah. That's true, right? He never really does say. He says he doesn't know what it is, you know. And it's like people put the extraterrestrial stuff on him, but he's like, I've never said this is extraterrestrial. Oh, I never thought about that, man. See, I'm, <laughs> I need to read more Strieber. It's one of the things that I haven't dove into. You know, obviously, I know a lot of Whitney's stories, but you right. hear him on podcasts all the time and sure being, sure being recounted, but but i haven't really dug into to to his stuff um there was, that's interesting there was something i was just going to bring up that, that you triggered when you were talking and i've i've lost it um no. oh, damn it there's a lot i like more talking sp- huh i was gonna say i like talking about the i mean the definitely the high, I love talking oh. about high strangeness and, and the fact that all this, the, uh, the phenomena, what, what do you call it? You know what right. I mean? I, I refer to it as the phenomena in there, but you know, well, <laughs> whatever this is, all the strangeness. You know? the first, the, the, the two things I, I want to say there is that a, whatever this stuff is, is like, we look at it as outside of us as supernatural or whatever. And I forget who said it. But someone said it's just rare phenomena. And mm-hmm. I thought that was perfect. It's, it, it's, you know, you have common experiences we all have, and then you have those rare experiences that not everyone is maybe even capable of having. Um, the other thing is, whatever this stuff is, has been with us throughout written history, throughout every culture in the world, and it's named different things, it's, you know, interpreted different ways, but it's there. So it's something real in the way that it's a human experience. And you can't, like, like as much as skeptics want to throw that out and say, oh, this stuff's not real, it's obviously real. That, that fact alone proves there's something happening that affects people on a deep level, whether it's coming from us or coming from an other, that we don't know. Like, we don't know what it is, and we don't know what to call it for sure. I mean, we all have, to, you know, some people will say, well, it's extraterrestrial or it's this or it's that, but we don't really know because we can't prove it. And that goes down to the we don't know what reality is, so we have no baseline. Yeah, yeah, and and it's like, um, it's definitely, it's not that they that whatever it is needs us, but it's interested in us. Yes, right. Yeah, and, and it, it might and there's need also, us. Yeah, 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 and, and there and there really is an element that I'll take any of these experiences, you know, that we're, we're talking generally about a lot of this stuff, but. But take any specific experience, and it is such a personal and specific and almost ma- – per- it's so personal, it's yes. almost magical, yes. right? Like the way that it's so personal to you is what makes it magic. 
and or feel like magic or feel like it's paranormal or supernatural, right? And but because of the specificity, and that again lends itself to this. That I mean, I, you know, I harp on it all the time. That idea of second order cybernetics. That idea of you as an observer are quintessential to this experience. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and that uh, it's like, you know, we got to explore those things, you know? Um, Jeffrey Kripal at one point blew my mind because he, he, he made this really simple comment. He was talking about why we don't get better lab results with psi research and stuff like that. And he said, well, the paranormal, supernatural, whatever you want to call it, happens to people for a reason. And I just stopped and went, wow, he just, that's pretty much it, isn't it? You can get minor sigh in, in research stuff, but those big experiences, they change you. You can't just make those happen. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, dude, it's absolutely true. I mean, that's the thing. Um, a lot of people, I think, or there's a, a larger perception of the, of paranormal and supernatural phenomena that it's um, unreasoned, right? That it's, that there's no reason behind it, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that, yeah. that, that, there's just a haunting or just a UFO sighting and that, that these ha these things are so rare and strange that they're supernatural, right? Yeah, yeah. Beyond that. But it's like, that's not true. They're very, very reasoned, right? And it's like the the understanding and the journey of the person who had the experience to unravel the reason behind it ends up being the thing that just blows open the doors of reality in their life. Yep. Right? Yep. You know? So we're out of, we're out of time already. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I checked off two things I wanted to talk to you about out of like 15. <laughs> Sorry, I rambled too. I apologize. <laughs> that is fine. No, that is great. So let's, uh, why don't, wh we'll do a Patreon segment, but why don't we do this again soon? And, oh, please. And we'll continue on, on another show, and then we can get some of these other things down. I love it. Let's do it. All right. So we'll do a Patreon segment for this one, and then we'll have you back soon. And where can people find Penny Royal? Uh, so Penny Royal is available on all major platforms, um, Spotify, Apple Music, anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, we also have a website, pennyroyalpodcast.com. And um, if anyone's interested in, you know, assisting us with research, uh, we've got a Patreon called the Liminal Lodge. But uh, if you search Penny Royal on uh, Patreon, you'll find it. And uh, yeah, we share all of our research every week. All the stuff we're looking at uh, as the story unfolds. So um, we love having more and more perspectives and opinions about all this stuff and help us dive into it. So yeah, that's great. And dude, thank you so much for having me tonight on the oh, show. Thank you for coming on. I love talking to you about this stuff. I would like to take a moment here to thank all of my patrons. If it wasn't for you, this show would not exist as it does. And I want to give a special shout out to those of you pledging $10 or more. Leanne Cherry, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Stephen St. George, CJ, Tim, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Bobby Bear, Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaiaquinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Chris Ernst, Craig Cisternos, Craig Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, Diane B, Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, Joanna Rojas, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Ron Dupree, Chuck Shutters, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, MJ Armstrong, Jim and Sophie, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Patricia W., Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Thunderboy, Timothy Castaneda, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, William Powell, Ren Collier, Stephen D., and Amber Hall. Thank you all so very much. So there's a lengthy Patreon segment uh, to follow this show. Also, Nathan and I have already set a time to record uh, part two next week because I barely got through any of the stuff we want. I wanted to talk about. So we're going to 
we're going to continue this conversation next week. So I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a Patreon one after next week as well, because there's just so much to talk, stuff to talk about um, as regards to all the uh, Penny Royal stuff. All right. Um, if you want to become a patron, where the road go.com, you can find all our social media there from discord to YouTube, to Twitter, to Facebook, the Facebook group, everything. Where did the road go.com. It's only $3 a month to become a patron. You get extra stuff every week and I will see you next time. You have been listening to where did the road go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did The Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.